back here in the Tower of London. I've been here several times since my four years here in UK, but never have I known the, the interesting histories underlying this uh, area. Not knowing that it's been here since the ninth century uh, in the existence of humankind. <laughs> um, the earliest noted was with William the Conqueror as he built this massive uh, tower in the fortress of London. And uh, for 400 years, it's, a, it's been also a place for execution. Today, in the 31st century, me and Jim will be going inside and explore what this history uh, tells us. So the, <laughs> we're just going to do a scan of the, the whole, whole place. Here we go. <laughs> So we'll find one, one end. <laughs> so it towers in. Yeah, there we go. I am always amazed on how these massive buildings were built in the ancient times when technology was still crude and simple. This was believed to be built in 1078, one of the oldest in London. But an older one was lying around the corner the All Hallows by the Tower, a church that was there 300 years before the Tower of London was built. Other old places in London were the Westminster Church, now the Abbey, which was there since the 8th century as a monastery and became a coronation church for the kings and queens in 1066, and the Westminster Hall, part of the House of Parliament or Big Ben, there since 1097. These are the oldest bits Anything older were all outside London. It is odd that the man responsible for the building of this historic fortress wasn't a native Englishman. William I, or William the Conqueror, was a Duke of Normandy, a group of conquerors which were descendants of Vikings from the northern France. He was a friend and far relative of the last English king, Edward the Confessor. When he died, he invaded England and defeated the brother-in-law of the last king, Harold, to be the next king of England. After his coronation in 1066, he began the building of the White Tower, the oldest building of the fortress. Since then, various monarchs have been responsible for the transformation of the fortress. Although many later kings and queens stayed at the tower, it was never intended as the main royal residence. Equally, the tower was not the first line of defense against invading armies, though it could rise to this challenge. As a power base in peacetime and refuge in times of crisis, the tower's fortifications here and there were updated and expanded. A series of separate building campaigns ensured that the tower was transformed into a formidable fortress we see today. As it was known as a place for prisoners and executions for hundreds of years, it's interesting that different parts of the area were linked to different people. This bloody tower held two Archbishops of Canterbury, a Lord Chancellor, and Sir Walter Raleigh, whose stay lasted many years. It was known as the Bloody Tower as it was believed to be the place where the two princes were murdered by their Duke uncle and their bodies later found here. Here in the White Tower, Reynold Slumbard, the Bishop of Durham, was imprisoned in 1100 by Henry I. Other prisoners include John the Good, a French king, and Charles, Duke of Orleans. In the upper chamber of the Salt Tower is a very fine with many examples of prisoners' graffiti contains this place showing the different kinds of treatment received by the prisoners who were held here. Prisoners include John Balliol, a Scottish king, imprisoned for three years, innkeeper accused of practicing sorcery, and an Italian tutor who used to carry Princess Elizabeth's private letters to her when she was imprisoned in the tower. With the audiovisual aids, you will be immersed by the stories of the people who used to say 
in the boundaries of this crying world. In the Beecham Tower, a carving of the saddest figure in the history of the tower can be seen. Lady Jane Grey was a queen for nine days. The 16-year-old was used by her powerful family to lay claim to the English throne but was ousted, imprisoned, and executed. This graffiti was not carved by Jane though, as she was imprisoned elsewhere in the tower. Her husband, Lord Guildford Dudley's family were, however, imprisoned in the tower and may have carved it. This memorial commemorates the execution site of the three English queens, Anne Boleyn, Lady Jane Grey, and Catherine Howard, who were beheaded here and seven more others. It was said to be a privilege to be executed inside the Tower of London, as it was generally done in Tower Hill, a nearby place, for spectators to see. Those inside were treated private, with respect, and even used expert swordsmen to ensure quick death. Nearby, one can see the Chapel Royale of St. Peter at Vincula, a Tudor chapel containing monuments to residents of the tower and its prisoners, including those executed on Tower Green. Three queens of England, Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, and Jane Grey, and two saints of the Roman Catholic Church, Sir Thomas More and John Fisher, are buried here. No photos taken from inside were allowed. Some torture machines were seen here, although it was said that it was not useful to use torture for prisoners before. Legend says that the kingdom and the tower will fall if the six resident ravens ever leave the fortress. It was Charles II, according to the stories, who first insisted this. There are seven ravens in the tower today. For over 600 years, animals were kept here as symbols of power and for the entertainment and curiosity of the court. Everything from the elephants to tigers, kangaroos, and ostriches lived in what was known as the royal menagerie. The crown jewels are the priceless symbols of British monarchy. The current display of the crown jewels was opened at the Tower of London in 1994 by the present monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. The enormous Cullinan One, or first star of Africa from South Africa, and the notorious Koino from India are part of the collection that numbers 23,578 in total. Other unpopular uses of the Tower of London were as the expansion of royal mint facilities in the end of the 13th century, as office of ordnance charged with storing and supplying arms and equipment to English, later British, military force, as royal observatory originally built so that the observations could be made to improve the Navy's navigational tables by astronomical means and as Tower Record Office. As a secure site, it made perfect sense for the most significant records of the emerging royal bureaucracy to be housed at the Tower of London. 